with you today. Uh, Ms. Lender, I thank you so much for them kind words, uh, but I have to tell you there's a lot better ministers in this church than me. Uh, I, I think of Miss Pat and, and uh, Brother Franz and Brother Butch and Brother Gary and uh, Edward and, and so many others that, uh, well, I just can't hold a candle to, but uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning and to support our, our pastor, Brother Dean. Uh, if you'll stand with me for the reading of God this morning. <clears throat> We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as jailed church children, and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. You'll bow your heads. Father, we come to you this morning to praise your holy name and to request your presence, your patience, and your Holy Spirit to guide us to improve our understanding of today's <coughs> message. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word with my family of faith, and I pray that you help me reach both hearts and minds today so that we might be fully, more fully, be representatives of your kingdom of heaven here on this earth that you created. Please direct our hearts to receive your message and move us to action for God's glory. In the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. 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 In preparing this week's lesson, God really convicted my heart uh, after a comment I'd made on some gun control legislation proposal that followed the terrorist attack in Orlando just weeks ago. The Holy Spirit reminded me that my mouth gives away what is in my heart. In this case, I really didn't like the aftertaste of what I had said. In that still small voice that we sometimes hear when the Father speaks to us, I felt I was being told that I was no better than any other sinner in this world because I was holding anger, angst, resentment, and judgment in my heart over many of God's people mostly what I consider to be sinners, of course. But still, God reminded me that it's not my place to judge someone else in this life because I, too, am a sinner. I'm a forgiven sinner, a follower of Christ, and certainly much less of a sinner than I was before I came to know Christ. Yet, still, I sin. So effectively, God reminded me that, and, and many like me, that sin every time I put on my false, I'm, I'm brother better than you facade face, you know, and attempt to pass God's judgments on to others whom I believe I'm better than. Romans 5 and 8 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that for a minute, please. God sent himself, his son, in human form to become sin and die a gruesome, painful death covered in our sins to ransom our eternal life in heaven with him. Jesus Christ loved us so much that he came to earth to show us the best example of how to live a godly life and how to live out of this world while residing in the world. I want to point out just a couple of ideas that I take from this scripture. First, I think it's important that we as Christians recognize that Christ did not just die for us Christians. We were all sinners long before we became Christians, and Christ died for those who were still unsaved. We were all sinners long before we were Christians. Secondly, God loves us humans so much that he sent his only son to pay the debt of our sin. As I stated last week, God mortgaged heaven to bring his children back to his home. As much as I love my wife, that's a depth of love that I don't think I'm capable of, of reaching today. I would lay down my life for Diane in a split second. Wouldn't even think about it but our son's life? 
I recognize that we must live in this world for a short time, but we don't have to live of this world. I'm learning that so many Christians, myself included, get wrapped up in passing judgments on the gays and liberals and sinners of all kinds that we don't even realize we're sinning ourselves by being judgmental, worldly people. Instead of being the godly people that we are made to be through Jesus' salvation. As Christians, Paul calls us, just as he did the Ephesians, to live an out-of-this-world life and to follow the examples of love and Christian living that God and his son Jesus Christ gives us. We're told to hate sin, but love the sinner. While this saying is not found in the Bible in so many words, I believe Jude 1, verses 22 and 23, and I prefer the NIV version uh, here, conveys that same message, though. It reads, Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. According to this, our evangelism as Christians should be characterized by mercy for the sinner, but a healthy hatred of sin and all its effects. We're to have compassion for sinners for whom Christ died, and we are to also keep ourselves from being polluted by the world that we reside in. Part of what constitutes pure and faultless religion, as explained in James 1 and 27, we also realize that we are imperfect human beings and that the differences between us and God in regard to loving and hating is vast. Even as Christians, we cannot love perfectly, nor can we hate perfectly. In other words, we as humans don't know how to hate without malice in our hearts, do we? But God can do both of these things perfectly because he is God. God can hate without any sinful intent. Therefore, he can hate the sin and the sinner in a perfectly holy way and still lovingly forgive the sinner at their moment of repentance and faith. The Bible clearly teaches us that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 read, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Only God can perfectly love and hate a person at the same time. This means he can love him as someone he created and can redeem, as well as hate him for his unbelief and his sinful lifestyle. We, as imperfect human beings, can't do this, so we must constantly remind ourselves to hate sin but love the sinner. How exactly does that work, though? We hate sin by recognizing it for what it is, refusing to take part of it, and condemning it as contrary to God's nature and natural law that God brings. Sin is to be hated, not excused, not taken lightly. We love sinners by showing them respect, like we're asked to do in 1 Peter 2 and 17. We love sinners by praying for them, as we're instructed in 1 Timothy 2 and 1, and witnessing to them of Christ. It's a true act of love to treat someone with respect and kindness, even though you don't approve of their lifestyle or sinful choices. It's not a loving person who would allow another person to remain stuck in sin. It's not hateful to tell a person that he or she is in sin. In fact, the opposites are true. As James 1 and 15 tells us, sin leads to death. And we are to love the sinner by speaking the truth in love, as we are directed in Ephesians 4 and 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up all things into him who is the head, Christ. 
We hate sin by refusing to condone it, ignore it, or excuse it. Yet if we merely demonstrate righteous condemnation to those living in sin, how will they ever come to recognize God's true love? How will they ever come to understand God's desire for them to return to his throne? That's, what, that's all God asks of us. He made them, so how can he, how can we as Christians, rather, choose to discard God's creation because they don't measure up to our earthly expectations? What I've come to feel in my heart in the days since this tragedy that, that happened is not contempt for the gay sinners uh, or hatred uh, for the radical Islamic terrorist who executed them as though he was appointed judge, jury, and executioner. Instead, I find a profound sense of loss in that sinners were lost to God forever because perhaps many of them never got to experience God's love through their interactions with God's children. In Ephesians 5 and 1, Paul told the Ephesians to be imitators of God. What a great piece of guidance and instruction for Christians. The word for imitators in the Greek means to mimic. And mimics, especially Christian mimics, are those who follow the pattern and example of God. So if you want to put it simply, you can say it this way. Be God-like. That is is the goal of Christianity. It is produce men and women, boys and girls, who are godlike in the midst of an ungodlike world. That's what the Christian life is all about. We're to live out of this world so that we might reflect God's love in this world. Notice that it doesn't say, though, to be gods. That's a lie of the devil. Satan distorts the truth, and he makes it come out as a promise to us that if we would just follow our own desires and throw overboard all the restrictions in life and cast aside the bonds of authority and do what we want to do, we can be just like God. Well, just ask Adam and Eve how that worked out for them. That's not what the Christian faith says, though, is it? It says, rather, be godlike meaning reflect the one true and holy God in our lives. There is only one God. There can only be one God. By definition, God is a supreme being. Our spiritual lives are connected to everything that we do. You can't separate the spiritual aspects of our life from its outward actions in the physical realm any more than you can separate a man's personal beliefs his morality, his values, his politics, from his religion. Each part of our personality has to work with the other parts. Spiritual life is a practical thing for the Christian, so how can we as Christians learn to imitate God? To imitate God, we must become his dear children. Note two things in the, in the phrase there in, in 5.1, as dear children as the word says, which some translations state as beloved children of God. First, we must become his children, and we can only do that through salvation. The accompanying rebirth of our souls and adoption into the family of God through faith in his son Jesus Christ is the only way to obtain eternal life and become his dear child. Well, I stated earlier that since we're all created by God, this doesn't mean that we are all children of God. The Bible is clear that we become children of God when we are born into his family through a spiritual new birth, through faith in Jesus Christ. John 1, 12 and 13 reads, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Whereas 1 Peter 1 and 3 puts it, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Also, as Paul states in <coughs> Ephesians 1 and 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. The, those two analogies, rebirth or, or new birth and adoption, bring out different important aspects of our relationship with God. The new birth or rebirth demonstrates the fact that God must impart new life to us if we are to enter into a relationship with him. Religion and good works are not enough to get a person into heaven. Nicodemus, who came to talk with Jesus, was a Jewish leader. He knew the Old Testament scriptures forwards and backwards, and he practiced the Jewish religious rituals every day. But Jesus told him in John 3 and 3, he said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When the Spirit of God imparts new life to us, we enter into a relationship with God the Father through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. The concept of adoption demonstrates God's sovereign choice of us as His dear children. Just as parents who adopt a child pick the child that they wish to adopt, so God chooses us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He already chose us. He knew we would be. The real difference between God's adoption and our human version is that human parents often pick the child uh, who is the most attractive or just the cutest little thing. You know? Well, certainly not in my case, as you can see, but that's, that's what usually drives it. God chose us knowing that we would be sinful and rebellious towards him. We can't ever understand God's great love until we understand the terrible depths of sin from which he rescued us. From the gutters of sin, by grace alone, he brought you and me into his house, and he gives us all the privileges of being his beloved child. If you wonder, how can I know if I'm born again? I would answer it the same way that Pastor Dean's message did a couple months ago. First, do you believe in Christ alone as your only hope for, for forgiveness of sins and eternal life? And do you see evidence that God has changed your heart? Faith in Christ is the main evidence that you've been born of God. If God has imparted new life to you, you will see evidence of it in your heart. You will have a new desire to love Christ, to obey him, and to know him more intimately. You'll love his word, and you'll love his people, even those he created, but is yet to adopt into the family of God. The second thing that we must remember is that we are all his children. Every parent I've known has a special place for their own children. Some of them can be the most spoiled, misbehaving, pretentious little cherubs you've ever seen in your life, it seems like, but in their parents' eyes, that child is perfect. Perhaps that's why it's so important that we raise our children in a Christian home today, in a Christian family, with Christian morals and a value system that's rooted in the Bible and not rooted in the world. Perhaps if more of those victims in Orlando recently have been raised in an atmosphere like the one I just described, then maybe less souls would have been lost to God. No matter how much an earthly parent loves his children, our Heavenly Father loves his own dear children that much more. As John states in 1 John 3 and 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. As his children, do we not have the responsibility to shine a light of Christ 
to those in the world who have not yet learned to see? To imitate God, you must be one of his dear children. To imitate God, we must know his ways. It's been said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of flattery you hear when someone's blowing smoke at you, and we've all had that in our lives. I mean the kind of flattery that comes when you portray the old adage, actions speak louder than words. It's when you imitate God and Christ through your actions that aligns with the examples that they've set for you that provide this sincere, honest example of how God has changed your life through your faith. Simply put, you can't imitate someone that you don't know. And the best way that I know for us to know God is to study his word and spend time with him in prayer. God reveals himself through his word, doesn't he? And that word is the Bible. It is crucial that we come to know God as he has revealed himself and not as, as the God that the world seems to want to portray an example of what I mean here is in the world, some Christians and some churches portray God solely as a God of love. And while he is certainly love personified, there's no question of that. That's not all that he is, is he? Yet some cho churches choose to only represent God as the loving God who accepts the sinful world. But leave out entirely that God is a jealous judgmental God who abhors man's sin. He's the God who will pass judgment on those non-believers when the day arrives. And he will pass judgment on those who are even his own dear children that choose to ignore his teachings and follow Christ's example. As my kid brother Paul puts it, I'm certain that there's going to be Christians in heaven who are singed and smell smoky after their time before God's throne. They'll be in heaven as believers, but they get there by the skin of their teeth. How sad would it be to live out eternity knowing that you had few rewards to offer our Savior based on how we chose to live a meek, selfish, silent Christian life here on this earth. God is holy and disciplines his children so that we may share his holiness. I, Verses come to mind is Hebrews 12:10 and Exodus uh, chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. We must learn of God and His ways through God's written revelation to us, the Bible. And we must submit to God as He is revealed in the Bible. We can't change God to fit what we think we want God to be. He is what He is. He is the great I am. To know God in his ways, we must, again, often spend time with him in his word and in prayer. I think about a child who spends very little time with his parents. He's not going to be very greatly influenced by his parents, is he? Influence is directly proportional to the time spent together. When a parent spends time with their children, they're going to pick up their mannerism, good or bad. They'll see how they treat their spouse and how they learn to relate to others. They'll see the parents' moral standards and be influenced to follow those same standards in their lives. They will hear the language, whether it is kind or abusive, and repeat it in their speech. Paul said in Philippians 3 and 8, Yet indeed, I also count all things less for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. That kind of ever-increasing knowledge of God and his ways only come through time spent in his word and in prayer. If you want God to change you, so that you might imitate him, you must be diligent to spend consistent time alone with him. There's simply no shortcuts. To imitate God, we must walk in love. 
To imitate God is comprehensive. We must speak the truth because he is the God of truth. We must be faithful in our dealings with others because he is a faithful God. We must be holy in all our behavior because he is holy. But the characteristic that Paul mentions that seems to sum it all up is love. As Paul states in Ephesians 5 and 2, as we read this morning, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and, for, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. To be like God, to imitate God, we must walk in Christ's love. Christ is our supreme example of God's love. To walk in love, we must understand the biblical definition of love. Webster defines love as, as an extreme affection for someone or something, an intense feeling. Well, as you all know, I love Diane's Sunday gravy. I mean, meatballs and sauce over al dente pasta just makes my mouth water whenever I think about it, you know. Uh, I love my friends. You know, many of you are here in this church today. And I love my wife. Of course, all of these things at differing depths of love as we understand it in society. An example, I could live without Diane's pasta. Wouldn't like it, but I could live without Diane's pasta. I've learned to live without certain friends or whom I thought were friends in my life. I don't know that I can ever live without Diane in my life. I, keep, I pray constantly that God care, calls me home first because I don't think I could face a day on this earth without my very best friend in the world. To walk in Christ's love, the example that God gave us to follow, we must recognize God's definition of love. In Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40, Jesus was questioned by one of the Pharisees' his lawyers who asked him, he said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Perhaps the best explanation that I can offer sums up for me what the Old Testament tells us to do. In Matthew 7 and 12, Jesus gave us the golden rule. He says, Dear ever, or therefore, rather, whatever you want me to do, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Or as we like to state it more simply, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The ultimate demonstration of God's love, though, was when he gave his own son to die for us on the cross. As John 3.16 proclaims, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or when Paul tells husbands in Ephesians 5 and 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. With these verses in mind, the best way I know to describe God's love is as a self-sacrificing, caring commitment that shows itself by seeking the highest good for the one loved and is demonstrated by one's words, actions, and deeds. There's five definitions that I have for, the, for this God's love. First is that God's love is costly. He gave his own son, Christ, willingly laid down his life for his bride, the church. While very few of us will ever be asked to die for someone else, we often have to lay aside our selfishness, our pride, and our rights to share God's love towards others. Second, God's love is caring. Psalm 103, verse 13 tells us, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. If we've ever stated about somebody, I couldn't care less what happens to 
to this person or, or that person. But we don't love them, do we? God's love cares deeply. God's love is a committed love. Jesus Christ didn't go to the cross because it felt good. Rather, he was committed to doing the will of the Father, and he was committed from saving his people from a life of sin. As 1 Corinthians reminds us, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. And where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. God's love is conspicuous. In other words, it shows itself. It's not just a nice thought, but it's also evident deeds. 1 John 3 and 17 tells us, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? God's love finally is consecrated. It's committed to seeking the highest good of the one loved. Because Christ so loved the church, he willingly sacrificed his human life to sanctify it. Are we willing to consecrate ourselves to show God's love to those uh, who are living in sin? Or do we choose to live a sheltered Christian life by merely hiding away our faith and only bringing it out on Sunday mornings like the Pharisees of old who worship publicly on the street corners? You know, they did that so that they'd be seen holy in man's eyes, not in God's eyes. Learning to walk in God's love is a lifelong process. Showing God's love in our life is not something that generally happens the moment that someone gets saved. As I mentioned earlier, it takes knowledge and understanding of God and his word to learn to walk as a Christian. The word walk implies a step-by-step, -step, slow and steady process of moving forward. It refers to our entire manner of life. Paul said in Ephesians 4 and 2 that we must walk with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. He goes on to say in verse 15 that speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, so that the body will build itself up in love, as it states in verse 16. I believe that the body that Paul is referring to here is the church. The point is, the longer that you're a Christian, the more your life should be characterized by love. Demonstrating God's love in our lives is a lifelong process <coughs> indeed, but we must strive to grow in it so that one day we may be able to walk in God's love. To walk in love, we must look to Christ, who is both our atoning sacrifice and great ex example of God's love in humankind. We must always remember that Christ offered himself to God as our sacrifice. His death satisfied the judgment that God placed on man for our sin. To ever hope to walk in God's love to live out of this world, you must first come to the cross and trust in Christ as your atoning sacrifice and become reconciled to God through his son. Then, with the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you can follow Jesus Christ as your example and begin your walk. I think of Jesus' example and how he walked in God's love. In a nutshell, he was kind and gentle with the broken, but he was forceful and direct with the proud hypocrite. He was a patient teacher, and other times he was pain, painfully blunt with his own disciples. Just ask when he reached out and smacked old Peter, right? Yeah. But his unyielding love brought Peter and the others through all of their failures to become the godly apostles of our early church. I encourage you to always look to Jesus as your best example of how to walk in God's love. Amen. 
Simply put, to walk in God's love, we must be willing to sacrifice ourselves for his glory. We must die to ourselves so that we might allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. To walk in love, especially with those sinners who are sometimes pretty difficult to love, we must allow Christ's sacrificial love to motivate us. Christ took the initiative to give himself on our behalf as a sacrifice for our sins, even while we were sinners. There's nothing in us to motivate him to love us. He gave his life sacrificially for his church. He sacrificed himself for his bride. He took on the sins of the world that we might be able to return to the family of God one day. He did so selflessly to please and honor the Father. Now as Christians, he calls on us to sacrificially love those who may not be very lovable. Since God is love, we imitate him by walking in love, motivated by Christ's sacrificial love that saved us from our sins. As Paul writes in Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to close with just three simple suggestions. As we strive to live godly lives out of this world, we should always look to God. We must seek to improve our understanding of God and his word so that we might imitate his truth and his love in this stained world. We must gain a knowledge of God so that we might give ourselves to imitating his love. If you're part of the family of God this morning, if you've been adopted into God's household, then there should be a family resemblance between you and your father. Secondly, I want to remind you to look to Jesus Christ. Use our Savior's life as an example of how to walk in God's love. If we're serious, as we should be, about imitating God, then there's no better reference point than Jesus Christ. As God in human flesh, Jesus gives us the best example of what it looks like for a human to walk in godliness. Amen. Lastly, I urge you to look to the cross. Look to Jesus' sacrificial death to pay the debt for our sins. Christ purchased our salvation with his own life. He, the perfect Christian man, became sin to pay our sins of spiritual death. Be willing to sacrifice your pride, your reputation in your church, your honor, your financial security, whatever it takes to show God's love in this world. Have you, like so many in today's church, decided that you're better to remain silent and live in this world, becoming judgmental and sanctimonious towards sin, rather than to stand up and walk in faith to confront sin by showing God's light and love to the world? Would you prefer to live an out-of-this-world existence while here on earth? demonstrating to others that while you're a resident of this world, you're a citizen of heaven. Are you, are you willing to risk who others think you are by showing yourself to be a true example of God's love to the world? I too long for the day that my Savior returns to gather his children and bring us home. I worry that I'll have little to show for my life as a child of God. I wonder what works I will have to show what treasures will I be able to lay at the foot of his throne when judgment day is, on, is upon us will I have been an acceptable imitation of God through the way I've chosen to live my life will there be that sweet pleasing aroma to God as I was given today's passage it became clear that I should live my life as an example of God's grace and love 
that directs others to Jesus Christ. God's love for his dear children demands that we offer no less than his love in return. So I wonder, if I were the only Christian that you were to meet in, in this world, would you want to be saved? Does my life make you want to know more about God and how he directs my thoughts and actions? If I'm the only person that ever tells you about Jesus, will the way I live my life add enough credibility to the love found only at the cross of Jesus? Can I compel you to follow him by my example? If you're not sure, then I encourage you to join with me and rededicate ourselves to being representatives of God during our brief time on this earth. If you've decided to follow Christ this morning, you want to dedicate your eternal life to being with him by beginning your walk in God's love, then join us as we sing hymn number 504 without him. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your kind attention and support this morning. Uh, please come back and see us at 6 o'clock tonight when uh, uh, one of our greatest teachers here, Ms. Pat, shares with us uh, her knowledge of the revelation. Uh, I'm going to ask us uh, to be closed in prayer. Brother Billy Jack Silman, would you close us in prayer, please? Yeah,